This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is American writer Mickey Spillane. I have two experts on him, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is American mystery writer Mickey Spillane. I have two people who will discuss him. On the left is Max Collins, and on the right is Kevin Smith. Uh, and we will start off, uh, as I usually do, I'll ask a little bit about the subject's background, let them give a little little bit of information about themselves, and then we'll hit the ground running. Uh, so Max Allen Collins, he's a well-noted author. Uh, he has written for many years in the genre, and he has written books about Spillane, and he is considered probably the preeminent Spillane expert. So welcome, Max. If you could give a little background about yourself, though, uh, other than what I've missed, uh, it would be appreciated. You bet. I um, first published in the early 70s. I saw my first book in 1971. I live in Iowa. I lived then in Iowa. I've lived in Iowa, this small town, Muscatine, my entire life. We're not too far from Iowa City, which is where the where I went to school at, and studied at the Writer's Workshop. And I studied with a very fine mainstream novelist, uh, Richard Yates, who really took me under his wing. And uh, that was really got me my start, got me my first agent. My first big gig was I, I wrote the Dick Tracy strip for 15 years uh, after Chester Gould retired. I was the first person to write it after the creator. And my first novel was published in 73. I sold the first couple of books while I was still at, at the University of Iowa. And uh, I've done a number of series over the years. I've done some independent filmmaking, I've written a few movies that uh, I didn't direct. And I've written a little bit about, uh, I guess, some, some, I have done some writing in, in, in terms of criticism. And I did a book called History of Mystery a few years ago. So uh, I'm not as big an expert as Kevin is, but I'm, I, I know, I know a bit. Well, and uh, I, th I think the thing I'm probably best known for is, uh, uh, the film Road to Perdition, which, uh, it was based on a graphic novel I wrote, and that reflects a whole area of my work that's been really probably my central concern as a, as a writer is writing historical, uh, detective private eye novels and crime novels often using real crimes and looking at them and sometimes coming up with new solutions to controversially solved or unsolved mysteries, things like the Lindbergh kidnapping and uh, the Huey Long uh, assassination. And uh, the most recent one of those is called Do No Harm. It was about the, Sh the Sam Shepard case that uh, inspired The Fugitive and uh, I just finished, it'll be out in December, a book called The Big Bundle, which is about a, fair, a, a once famous kidnapping, the Greenlease kidnapping. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what's going on right now. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Burton Smith, he is, uh, called himself, what is the thrilling detective guy? Uh, that your, just your, your, of the website. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if you could give a little background about yourself and it, your interest in Spillane. Uh, I, I just read whatever Max writes, and that's kept me busy for the last 400 years or something. I'm flattered that you think I know more about the field than you have, uh, Max. Uh, I guess my main claim to fame is that I do the Thrilling Detective website, which is coming up on its 25th year. Uh, it's basically a website devoted to private eyes. Uh, I have a spiel where I go, it's the tough guys and or no, tough dicks and James who make trouble with their business, not their hobby. It's about private eyes, bodyguards, hitmen, professional thieves, reporters, people who would stumble into crime as a part of their profession, not because they find it fun to investigate. Uh, I don't do cops generally, unless they think they're private eyes, like Chester Himes characters, or maybe, uh, James Lee Burke's Robichaux, who seems to always be finding a way to get into a case in a way that makes him work outside of his own sheriff's department. Uh, that's about it. I'm a struggling fiction writer. Um, you know, 
Max writes three novels in the time it takes me to write one short story. So I'm in awe of him here and I'm flattered to be on this panel with him because he knows so much about Spillane. He hasn't just written the book on Spillane, he's written the books on Mickey Spillane and as if that isn't enough, he's written the books by Mickey Spillane. He's co-written, um, I think, 13 novels now picked up from uh, scraps of ideas and outlines that Mickey Spillane left behind. He's the literary executor of the Spillane estate, and I'm just jazzed to be here. Uh, I'm going to nod a lot while Max talks. Well, let me just and, ask you one question. Uh, you mes mentioned Chester Hines. That, he, he's one of the few black writers. That He, he is the black fellow. Because I, I do have a book of his collected short stories that I read years ago, and I, the na name is the first time I've heard it mentioned in years. Is, is that the same person I'm thinking of? Yes, yes. Uh, his two uh, New York cops, uh, Coffin Ed and Grave Digger Jones, were theoretically policemen, but they uh, were as much a part of the NYPD as the Continental Op was in Red Harvest. I mean, th they're cops only in name. They're there to shape the world in their the way they think the world should be. Uh, and yes, he's probably the first uh, major black writer in hard-boiled crime fiction to really make an impact. Everyone, go out and read those books; they're great. Well, let me. Play. I agree. Well, let me. Let, let me. Let's put uh, Spillane in context before we do the biography. Um, it, he came along basically about a hundred years after, I guess we call detective fiction was started, and is Edgar Allan Poe generally considered the first mystery writer, or uh, what, uh, Max? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there, there, there are some formative things that that happened that, that haven't stayed in the culture the way Poe has. And he really only wrote a handful of, of stories. I think, are, Kevin, are there three that he did about Dupin? I think the general consensus is five, but like you said, they're, it's a handful. they're all over the place. And he's, he's probably more known for The Raven because everyone had to study it in high school. Well, he, yeah, for a writer with uh, a fairly limited output, he was incredibly uh, influential uh, because you've got all the horror fiction coming out of him as well. So he was the wellspring for two major major genres. Um, he basically, I think, he, he created the template more for the Agatha Christie mystery. You, you have basically the, the, the pattern for uh, Perot. And that that kind of character, and Perot is I, I should hold, I should hold Kevin's feet to the fire a little bit because Perot is actually a private detective. And yes, he is. And he he does work for money, uh, which is interesting. He's just not tough and hard boiled. Uh, Christie was uh, is a very interesting writer because uh, she's often labeled cozy. When you actually read the books, they're full of people being strangled in bathtubs and I mean just they're, they're horrifically violent a lot of violence happens off stage but uh, they're not uh, they're not the, the body in the library even though she wrote a book I think called the body in the library yeah. uh, the thing about Christy that people really miss is that she was a master at writing about evil oh yeah the most for some of her mysteries is just astounding the uh I think it's the mirror cracked. Is the the motive behind it is still disturbing to this it day. Uh, you know, it's just you want to know about pure evil, not because they're real estate developers or you know they saw something like her her villains and the evil they bring to the show are just often more memorable than the whole plots, which can get very crazy. Well, we're getting a, perhaps a tad a bit ahead with Spillane, but there is a crossover here because uh, one of the things that I think confounds critics sometimes, and critics have always not have always been unfriendly to Mickey, not that he hasn't had some good reviews, but one element of Spillane that is not talked about much is that he really he really does present puzzles that are similar to Christie's, and he because he was a big surprise ending guy. He really wanted the ending to be be outrageous, and like Christie, wanted the villain to be the the the, the who person to be someone that you would not suspect. 
that that just is outlandish. Now sometimes it's obviously the femme fatale, Kevin, and 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 yeah, and Spillane. But I mean, he has you know both Christie and and Spillane about the same time wrote books with child murderers, and th- that kind of thing just 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 wasn't done. And I think when you look at somebody like Chandler or Hammett, as wonderful as they are. Uh, Chandler, in particular, his his mysteries creak like a like a, a, a shingle in the wind. I mean, it just I mean he he was he really liked to do everything except tell the mystery story, and he was wonderful at everything except tell. I mean, it was all about the way the words were put together. It was all about the poetry, and oftentimes he stitched old stories of his of his together. And not always convincingly turned them into one story. So he was not a, a constructionist in that, in that way. And Hammond was, uh, you know, ha- Hammond was better at that. But they're relatively simple plots that are draped in a lot of excellent characterization. Uh, but Spillane has a hard-boiled detective in the middle of often uh, a fairly traditional kind of uh, puzzle mystery. Because he wanted to surprise you. He was all about shock and surprise. So let me just uh, ask, uh, we'll talk about the biographical background of Spillane uh, just sure. for a few minutes here. So he was born in 1918, Frank Morrison Spillane. Uh, and how did he get the name Mickey? And I know there's an American gangster who was called Mickey Spillane. Uh, did right. he take the name from the writer? And was no, and, and, uh, and, and Mickey Spillane Mickey was, was before Mickey. the mouse and mantle. So it was... How did he get Mickey? Yeah, no, he, he, it just was a, an Irish, a common Irish nickname, obviously a Mick. And his, his father called him Mick. And his father was a bartender. And he, he called him Mick, and it evolved into Mickey. And significantly, he was probably the first American writer, maybe international writer, to use his nickname as part of his byline. That just wasn't done. And he was sending a signal with that byline. I'm, I'm a blue-collar guy. I'm one of you. He was really sending a, a signal with that. Now, as far as the real, the, the gangster Mickey Spillane, it became, when he was killed, Mickey Spillane, the gangster, was killed, there was a lot of confusion in the press about whether Mickey Spillane, the writer, had been killed. And and I know his family would call him, is that all right? Is that all right? You know, no, he's fine. It, he, so so there was confusion because he was a New York gangster. And, of course, Mickey was very, uh, you know, very associated with, with New York. New York was his Wild West, basically. Any comments, Kevin? No, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, I had read one thing where um, – Mickey Spillane had a Catholic mother and a Protestant father, or the other way around. And apparently he was baptized twice, and once his middle name was Michael. And Michael might have derived from, uh, Mickey might have derived from Michael, too. Yeah. You know, that's one thing I read in, like, weird things you didn't know about famous writers. Well, they called him Morrison in school, and uh, he... Uh, he, he learned to read before he got into school. He lived in a kind of a rural, he lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey, but it was the, a rural uh, aspect of that. It was on the outskirts. And so he had chickens in the yard, and he always thought of himself as kind of a country boy, which is ironic when you think about his reputation and his image as the ultimate sort of urban warrior. But he always thought of himself as a, you know, as, as, as you, all you guys... That, don't, that lived in New York, see, you were all flatland foreigners, he, he would say. And uh, so he, he had a different view of himself than, than you might, might expect. But he, he was very well read. I mean, he, he was at, I know they assigned him in a grade school class, if you can imagine this, to read Moby Dick. And he said, yeah, that's a good book. I already read that. And the teacher thought he was lying and showing off that he had already read it. He was a voluminous reader, and he was you know, quite well self-educated, I, I would say. He was not the sort of the D's, D's, and Dems guy that you might uh, might assume. Um, let me uh, talk just briefly about his World War II service. Uh, he was in the Army Air Corps, he, and, and, uh, he, uh, and I always connected him sort of with uh, actually Rod Serling, as odd as that might sound, because both of them seem to have 
have the the war seemed to play a big part of them. I can't I can't believe that I, I know Serling, whether in the teleplays, Twilight Zone, or later works, even the Planet of the Apes screenplay he wrote, death and 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 the the cruelty that men inflict upon each other was always present in his work. And I think uh, even though Spillane wasn't writing about war. Uh, in a one-to-one -one way, he, that seemed to always be in a lot of this, this overt violence, machismo. Um, what effect did World War II have on him? Well, it's it's, it's not exactly what what Serling brought to the table because Mickey had learned he, he was enthusiastic about flying, and he had hung around airfields when he was a little kid, and he got, he got himself flying when he was a teenager. By some reports, he may have been as young as 13 when he started flying. And so when he when he went into the Air Corps wanting to be a, a fighter pilot, he they found out how well he flew and what he knew about flying, and he became an, an instructor. So he was made a flight instructor, and he always bridled against that. He wanted to he wanted to go to, to combat. And he never did. He fought a stateside war. He was assigned to uh, he was assigned to a fighter pilot squadron, but the war was over before they got sent, before they got shipped out. So he had a sort of survivor's guilt about it. He had a certain guilt for not having been, you know, in combat. He had not that he had not gone overseas, and he was very touchy about it. If a um, an interviewer asked him about it, the interviewer could get into really dangerous rocky waters with him and it's like something i never discussed with him because i knew it was a hot button topic um in fact some of his closest friends said that's the one thing you don't talk to him about because he he feel he he really and then he became extremely identified with the war because my camera is an ex-combat you know he's an he's an ex-army guy who fought in the in in, uh, in, in the pacific and the whole Mike Hammer mythos begins with him swearing of the, the dead body of his combat buddy who lost an arm for him, who took a jap bayonet for him. He swears he's gonna he's gonna avenge his friend mm -hmm. from the war. That's what and that it all for everything flows from that. And I think it was crucial to why that book took off so well. Among the uh, you know the World War II veterans, returning veterans, because they absolutely, first of all, they liked the level of violence that they saw in the movies that was, seemed childlike to them. So he he upped the ante there. The sex was all you know production code controlled in the movies, and and books hadn't been too extreme. He upped the ante there, and then he did it in first person. So that, that the person, so that the reader would be right in, you know, in Mike Hammer's mind and eyes, behind his eyes, and never, never described Hammer, hmm. never described him. So anybody, anybody who read the book, any, any man at least who read the book, could visualize himself as Mike Hammer. Hmm. And all of those, I, I don't know how well he thought that stuff out or whether it was something very instinctive to him, but it really was all about what are the other guys, what would the other guys want to read after, after, after the war? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the quotes that for many years I've known about Spillane was that uh, some critic once said that he wrote comic books for adults or adult males. And uh, uh, meaning that, you know, his, his novel was sort of like comic books uh, co come alive. And I see that he had, had done some work in the comic book genre and it's interesting, that was in the 40s, the 1950s comes the comics code. So in a sense, was he freer to, to write his, his violent uh, uh, descriptions of, uh, of action as a, a real writer, so to speak, rather than a comic book writer that had been circumscribed then? Well, actually, the, the comic book writers of that period, a lot went. I mean, you, you know, they, they, they could do pretty much what... Not not sexually, although there were a lot of sexy babes in comic books, but he was initially a comic book writer. I mean, that's what he was was a comic book writer. Interestingly, he what they used him for primarily was to write the fillers in in these comic books. Every 
the all of these comic books at that time, there was a poster regulation that they had to have at least two pages of prose in, in every issue of a periodical to qualify as a periodical. And so they had some, you know, get, get Splane over here. And he would do those because they paid 25 bucks a piece. And that was huge money in those days. And he would write three or four of them a day and, you know, say, I made more in a day than, than a hardworking guy can make in a week. And, of course, that meant all through his comic book years he was writing prose. Mm. So, and, and he claimed that he wrote for a lot of pulps and so on, but we've never been able to, you know, we never found his byline, let's say. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, at any rate, uh, Mike Hammer began as a comic book character, initially called Mike Danger, also called Mike Lancer, that he did in the comics. And then he had not been able to sell the Mike Danger post-war. He had not been able to sell Mike Danger to a comic book company. And he needed money to, he had a, a piece of land uh, in New Jersey. And he wanted to build a house and he needed money. So he thought, hey, they're paying 250 bucks for books, mystery books. I bet I could write one of those. I've got this Mike Danger character I created. I'll just put him in the... And I'll just change his name because Mike Danger was a comic booky name, but he did a hard hitting name, obviously. Yeah. And so he would he used to tell people that story and then say, "Now you know what you've been reading all these years." <laughs> uh, let me ask you, Kevin. Uh, regarding the comics code, um, you know, famously, uh, Batman and Robin were thought to be promoting homosexuality. But if you look at some of the lurid uh, kind of covers of the the pulp books that uh, Spillane started out in. Were they were they more free? Do you think than uh, the comics were? When did the comics code come in? In fifty three, fifty four, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what? Did... Um, well, where um, Spillane was going with Mike Hammer, no way could he have done Eye of the Jury as a comic book, really. But you know, there is a precedent for that in uh, Jonathan Latimer back in, I guess the late 20s, early 30s, he could have written for the pulps, but he chose to write novels because he felt he could have more leeway. And he filled his early books with a lot of drinking and violence and sex that he would have never got away with in the pulps, as, as wild as the pulps could be. Mm -hmm. so, so there was a precedent that way, but certainly by the 40s, um, you know, there wasn't the uh, sex and violence that Spillane brought to the party. I mean, and you had a whole generation of men coming back from the war that grown up at poor in the depression, and suddenly they were thrust into a war halfway across the planet, and they came back. And you know, there's no doubt there was a huge generation of men and some women who had seen a lot, and they realized that. They weren't in Kansas anymore, unless they were in Kansas. But, you know, suddenly the world where everything was about, you know, the middle class and suburbs and the white picket fences and get the new Frigidaire and the oven and everything, there, 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 there was something missing because the culture they came back to in a few years was not reflecting what they had been through. And I think... In a weird way, uh, Spillane reasserted, no, you didn't imagine it. That world still exists. You saw it firsthand. And they got back from the war. And uh, I, I think that's part of what drove his popularity. And another part of his popularity has to be the fact that the paperback industry was just taking off. Yeah. Which was also a side effect of the war because they started printing paperback so the GIs and everyone would have something to read in the trenches or wherever they were stationed. It was easy to slip a paperback into your pocket or something, but it was a bit harder to bring a full-size hardcover, you know. See, and that's key. Love... That's key. That's absolutely key. Because those, those little portable, and, and Mickey always said, I knew that's where it was heading, that they that the paperbacks would come in. And he always wanted I, the jury, to go to paperback and the original deal with with Dutton 
came from Roscoe Fawcett, who was Fawcett Publications, the distributor, saying, I will distribute that as a paperback, but the way it was then, you had, kind of had to be in hardcover first. Yeah. And so, yeah, so yeah. That, that's what happened. But if I can go back just a little bit, in addition to those paperbacks that were distributed and, and turned that generation into, oddly, a book reading generation, uh, the other thing was they were selling comic books at PXs. And the comic books were equally portable, something you could roll up and stick in your back pocket or whatever. And so those, those men also learned to read comic books. So there was a boom in, in the late 40s and early 50s of more adult material in the comic books. It wasn't always super overt. It might just be sexy looking women, but the violence came up. There were crime does not pay comics. There were horror comics, the EC comics. And so these comic books were not really being produced for children. They were being produced for that audience that came back from the war and that audience that was had, had generally lost its innocence. And so when, when the critics, primarily Dr. Frederick Worth, Wortham, mm. came forward and said, these funny books are bad for kids, it was, it was a bunch of BS, really. I mean, blaming juvenile delinquency on comic books just generally is, is, is idiotic. But that's the atmosphere out of which Mike Cameron and... and and Mickey Spillane thrived. And very interestingly, I don't know if you know this, Kevin, but there's this famous book, Seduction of the Innocent, that yeah. Dr. Wordham um, wrote yeah. about comic books, about how bad comic books were. He discussed one American author in detail, Mickey Spillane. So that book is anti-comic books and anti-Mickey Spillane. And that's absolutely true. Yeah, but Worth Wortham yeah. is right up there with Newt Minow as one of the most clueless people of the mid twentieth century America. I want to uh, pick up on two points: one that Max had made, and then another one, and then we'll get into uh, Spillane, his uh, writing career proper. The the first seven books, which I guess are considered sort of the canonical seven, from what I've read. But uh, uh, you had mentioned uh, Max talking about the paperback industry and Spillane knowing that's where it was going, and it's interesting because. I know that, uh, speaking of comic books, that uh, one of the precursors to Superman was Doc Savage, the Man of Bronze, back in the late 20s, early 30s. And it was not until the paperbacks came along in the late 50s and he was reprinted that Doc Savage became really a big uh, figure uh, within the, I guess you'd call it the fantasy genre mm -hmm. or, or whatnot. So they really took you know, some older stuff and blue and same thing with uh, Rice Burroughs, his, uh, his Tarzan and John Carter books took off again with paperbacks. Um, uh, when you said that Spillane True. saw this coming, did he see this coming in terms of an artistic way or, or uh, a financial way or both? Well, he was a guy that, uh, if you try to call him an artist, you know, you, you might get yourself in trouble. <laughs> But, but in fact, he was an artist. I, I, know, I did a documentary about him, and I ended up interviewing him for five hours, you know, to get the half hour I wanted, because Mickey had all, because he did a lot of media, and he had all of these stories, and all of these anecdotes, and all of this canned stuff. I could, I could almost give you 10 anecdotes without breaking a word that he did. I mean, they just... He, 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 he really controlled that. So I would have to talk to him and talk to him. When I really got him going, he talked about how important language was to him and how important words were and how, how important storytelling was. But you had to get his guard down. You had to really get past that because he was criticized so much. I, I, would, I would venture to say, and I, I got a hunch Kevin would agree, no American writer ever got more criticism ever got more heat than Mickey Spillane. Yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, because uh, this talk was coming up, I just deep dived into everything I could read about Spillane and my camera over the last few days. And like, some of the stuff, like, I mean, he was like, Jack the Ripper of the literary world. I mean, I, I could see people not liking his books or not appreciating this part or that part, or they didn't think it worked for them.
but the stuff he was being blamed for was like, it was amazing. The, there was this huge, huge uh, it, backlash against his success, which is probably part of what pushed it. The, his very success is what drove people crazy. I mean, and the literary world then and now is mostly full of liberals. Uh, and Mickey wasn't, uh, Mickey Spillane was not a liberal in any big liberal way, you know. He might not have minded uh, your race or your creed or whatever, but he had definite opinions about everything else. And, um, you know, for, for, for the uh, literary critics or even just regular run of the mill critics of any pulp culture, this was like waving a red flag. Well, what would happen a lot of times in these in these reviews is they they would repeat the same quotes from the books to the extent that you began to think they'd been re the reviewers and, and critics had been reading each other oh, yeah. and, and not him because many of the things he was attacked about just don't hold up if you have any kind of literary training credentials insights at all. For example. I mean, they will say, uh, the two, there's two things that they always say about him. One is that, oh, the books are all about commie bashing. Well, it's he one wrote book. one book, and, and the commies in his book are, are blue meanies. I mean, they're not, I mean, it, it, the, the level of sophistication he brings to, to, to the commies, they're just the Nazis, they're just the whatever the bad guy is. And it's just, it, it's just, it's so lazy. To, to make that the, the critique. The other one is misogyny, because, spoiler alert, he, he kills the femme fatale at the end of, of I, the Jury. And they would say to him, Mickey, why, why, do, you, why, why do you have women be the bad guys in your books? He says, oh, they're the bad guys about half the time. There's only two choices. Of course, he came up with the third choice in Vengeance is Mine, but, but the fact is, he had in Velda his secretary partner, who's a private detective. There's two private detectives in the agency, and one is a woman. And she's very strong. And the femme fatales are all very strong. They, they're almost always smarter than Mike Hammer. And the women in those books, while they're not depicted with great depth, are definitely strong women. They're they're not they're they're not the baby doll kind of women that you would you would expect if you had read the critics, and so this notion that he's he's a misogynist misses a bigger point, which is if he is anything, he's a misan misanthrope. Yeah. I mean, he's, he he doesn't have a high opinion of humanity yeah. Yeah. at all, uh, and yet and yet he helps the little guy. Yeah. In those six novels you mentioned, six of the seven, one is a nod in my camera, he never has a client. He's always helping somebody. He's avenging somebody or helping somebody. And it's and all personal. It's all personal. I, the jury. Vengeance is mine. My gun is quick. Yeah. Just like the Beatles. All you, you know, all you need is love. Hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. Oh, well, wait, whatever. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're waiting for the big McCartney Spillane crossover. Still, you'll have to finish it up, Max. Well, well, as as Dan was was saying about the pop culture of that era, is not a very long line between Mickey Spillane and Elvis Presley. No, nope. there's there's not a very long yeah, you know, and there's there's not much difference between the way you know the you know the parents and the societal arbiters reacted to those two. Oh, sense of that boy's hips. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, never shot Mickey Spillane from the waist up. <laughs> so. Well, let me ask you, Kevin, uh, before we uh, talk about some of these, these books uh, a, a little bit in depth for a few minutes each, um, I have to believe that since Spillane's first book came out in 47, he probably wrote it in the same year or maybe a year earlier. By that time, the film noir genre had been established. You had strong women characters played by strong women actors, loves like Barbara Stanwyck, Joan Crawford, and a handful of others. How influenced was he by 
film noir. I mean, I th there seemed to ha have to be some kind of a feedback loop since in the 50s, a lot of his stuff was made into film noir. Uh, I'm not so sure about, you know, Max might know more about uh, Mickey's film watching, but for me, the biggest and most obvious uh, influence on um, Mike Hammer was uh, Carol John Daly's Race Williams and Three Gun Terry, who appeared in Black Mask magazine. And Race Williams in particular was basically uh, Mike Hammer for an earlier generation, a generation that had just come back from World War I. Mm -hmm. And there was the same, uh, uh, I mean, Race Williams was, um, he tried to explain sometimes how he felt about things, whereas, you know, and he philosophized and he showed up in about a million short stories. But uh, when uh, Mike Hammer came along, there was no doubt in Mike Hammer. He knew what was right and what was wrong. Race Williams would say, I never killed anyone what didn't deserve it. But Mike Hammer didn't mess around. He just said, I'm going to kill the bastard who did this. Mm -hmm. There's a straight line for Mike Hammer. But... Um, Mickey Spillane was obviously a fan. There's a fan letter he wrote to uh, Carol John Daly, John Carol Daly, I keep forgetting. Sure. How to name. But there's a fan letter saying that basically, Mike Hammer is Race Williams. I copied you, I ripped you off. How you feel? <laughs> you know? And uh, But you, if you've read any of the early uh, Race Williams stories, you can s clearly see the pattern for uh, Mike Hammer. All um, Mickey Spillane did in some ways is just take that character and Daly was not a great stylist, but Spillane was. You may not like his style, but he knew what he was doing and he just revved up Race Williams and gave him to a newer audience that had seen even more of a mess than uh, Williams had seen. You know, the now, audience was primed for Mike Hammer and a Spillane delivered. Max, uh, let me just ask you. I've always thought in the back of my mind that Mike Hammer, like you said, could be an everyman, but the on-screen presence that most is Mike Hammerish, other than what Spillane played him as, uh, uh, is Bob Mitchum. Mm. Uh, uh, what? I can see that. I can see thinking that. And uh, in uh, he, he played Mike Hammer in the movie The Girl Hunters. Mm in the early 60s and that kind of presence uh was uh, very much very much the kind that, that mitchum conveyed i don't know what more i can say about that other than i than i agree with you okay well let's then move on to the books proper then um as i'm looking down my list here and i'm using uh uh, Wikipedia. So if it's wrong, please tell me because it's Wikipedia. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it looks like uh, in his lifetime he wrote thirteen books. Uh, are they just the thirteen Mike Hammer books? You mentioned yes. one wasn't Hammer though, right? Yeah, he wrote he wrote about twenty seven, twenty eight books, I think. Okay, so that and a lot of novellas, a lot of novellas. Um, when I say books, I mean novels. Yeah. Uh, he he wrote quite a few novellas. There's an interesting. There's an interesting aspect of him I don't know if you want to get into, but he stops, he stops writing my camera in 1952 and does not bring my camera back until 1962, basically. And this this 10 year um, gap, we always thought, almost all of us had thought that that was because Mickey had converted to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. Uh, this very conservative religious sect, and you're not supposed to smoke, you're not supposed to drink to excess, all, all the Mike Hammer stuff you weren't supposed to do. And they certainly did, would not ap uh, approve of his writing. And we assumed that that's what happened. That, that's why there was this long gap, and then he left the church and returned to his old ways, shall we say. But what I what I found out in my research, uh, I should mention, Jim Trailer and I have a book coming out in January of 2023 called Spillane, K 
King of Pulp Fiction, and it is a 350-page biography of Mickey Spillane. And it's all in there. And we, in, in doing the research, what I discovered was Mickey was very unhappy with Victor Seville, the Hollywood, by way of England, producer who bought the rights to the Mike Hammer novels for film. He didn't like any of the movies. Now I will stop and say he wasn't right about that. There's a couple <laughs> of really good movies there. Kiss Me Deadly is about as, as good a private eye movie has ever been made except for maybe the Maltese Falcon and Chinatown. I mean, it's in the upper, upper reaches. But he didn't like any of this stuff. And he was also misled by the producer. There was a key incident that happened. And that was that he had, Mickey had, and had a real life cop who was a combat veteran significantly, who really looked like my camera in Mickey's mind. A big guy, tough, with all his police experience, and he wanted him to play my camera in the movies. And Victor Seville, in that Hollywood way, rather than tell him, Mickey, it's unrealistic. You can't take a guy off the street and, and just, he said, well, why don't you go make a t screen test with him and we'll give it serious consideration. In the meantime, he went off and, and, and cast who he wanted to cast. Guy named Biff Elliott, who I think did a, did a good job. But he played Mickey. He disrespected Mickey. And Mickey was never happy after that with, with the movies. He even did a movie playing himself, basically as Mike Hammer, that John Wayne produced called Ring of Fear to compete with the Mike Hammer movies. He was furious about this. But the contract meant that Seville got any Mike Hammer material, any book, any novel material that, that Mickey did during the contract span. And this is what we always assumed was Mickey being tamed by the Jehovah's Witnesses. No, he did not want to give Victor Seville a Mike Hammer book to make. So he wrote novellas for men's magazines, very low end, really. And in 1958, when the contract was up, then comes Darren McGavin playing Mike Hammer. Mm -hmm. Then comes Mickey going back into novel writing. And The Girl Hunters is published in, I think, 61. And is it 61? I think, think I don't know if you have it in it front of you. It says 61. But it's, it's, you know, and then the movie's made, it comes out in 63, I think. But at any rate, uh, that's what was going on. And I don't think you knew that, Kevin, because I just found that out in my research. But yeah. Was, didn't you have, hadn't you bought, I mean, we all thought it was that he became a Jehovah's Witness and he couldn't write right. my camera anymore. Much. But he did keep writing, like you said, novellas for, uh, I think he wrote something for Manhunt Magazine, too. Yeah. I mean, he was all over the place. So, and it's not like suddenly he was writing Miss Marple or something oh. during years away from Hammer. But I didn't know the whole thing about him in Seville. Well, there, there was a great thing. One of the one of the articles I found it was it was done in Canada, and I, I'd never seen this this piece before. But the guy is interviewing Mickey about the Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mickey says, um, "I am going to now. It's I've completely changed my writing style. Everything I do is going to be for God." Everything's going to be, I'm throwing all of that stuff out. I'm not going to do any more of the sex and violence. And I'm writing a whole new book now that's going to show everybody what the new Mike Hammer is. And the interviewer says, and what's the name of the book? He says, Kiss Me Deadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can tell those Canadians anything. <laughs> well, that's true. But, but I mean, that's, that's, that's Mickey kidding himself, right? Um, yeah. Uh, or Max Link, the porter's leg. Uh, yeah, it's called Kiss Me Deadly. <laughs> now, Max, Actually, he said, Kiss Me, comma, Deadly, huh. because punctuation, it was important to him in the titles. Now, Max, let me just ask you, when you talked about the dissatisfaction with the films, most famously or infamously is the ending to Kiss Me Deadly, the film, which was very different from the book. I don't know if you want to talk just briefly about was that changed by the studio, by the director? Because I've, I've read that, and 
if you want to cause it, if it later influenced the Pulp Fiction, you know, the whole suitcase thing. Um. Right. Well, that's another thing that we discovered in the research was that uh, you, you, you see, now I love that movie. I'm a big fan of Robert Aldrich. I'm a big fan of A.I. Bezzarides, the, the novelist who wrote the screenplay. It's a great screenplay. It's a great movie. But they would go out and say, Bezzarides would say, well, we, th we threw the book away. We didn't use anything in the book. Now, if you've read the book, it's everything in the book is in the movie pretty much. It's, it's relatively faithful. The big change, the well, the, there's a change in attitude because they don't like my camera. And they let, let they let that show big time. But they change the ending and they say, well, we we knew that we wanted to do this, make this statement about atomic energy and and, and a lot of left wing stuff. And I'm left of center myself, but I know I know BS when I, I smell it, whichever side of me it comes from, and. <laughs> What I found out was that it originally in the script it was drugs, a box of drugs, just like it was in the novel. And the production code said, you can't put drugs in that box. You cannot, you cannot have, uh, have the story hinge on drug addiction. And they, they came up with this as a replacement for, you know, they pulled it out of their, you know, where they pulled it from. And uh, I thought, well, I hope we can get away with this. And of course, now it's, a lot of what makes the movie special gives yeah. it a whole resonance. And I, I don't take anything away from the filmmakers, but, you know, they, were, they, they sold it as a Mickey Spillane movie. I mean, it, the idea that... Uh, I, I feel they lost Mike Hammer in some ways there. It, he didn't feel like Mike Hammer to me, but I enjoyed the movie assuming it wasn't Mike Hammer, mm -hmm. but someone sort of like him. Well, I mean, he certainly kept fooling around movie. in the sports car just didn't seem like Mike Hammer to me. Maybe maybe it was like a uh, faux hammer. <laughs> well, my take on it is it's a, I mean, hammer is first person. It's interior. Yeah. This is third person. This is somebody else's view of Mike Hammer. Uh, and, and yes, they, th there's a lot of stuff they didn't do, but everything everything in the movie is pretty much in, in the book. It's attitudinal mostly ab about him. So um, so, so you said something important there about it being first person, and let's talk about uh, most yeah. of the books. Now, I've read the first seven with, up till 52. I haven't read the latest stuff. I, we can talk about if he continued that. But one of the things that drew me into his style, style and I came in fairly virginal. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't really know much about my camera uh, before I got about 20 years ago, someone gave me a book for Christmas or my birthday or something, and I read the first seven, uh, th I think it was a two-part thing, I read the first three and then four and the second. The The thing that, that really grips you is you are put in place and you you are behind the eyeballs. I, you, I've always said, instead of looking at the character, you want to know a character, know what that character sees. And what you see with my camera is you see, oh, there's a book. There's Velda. There's there's the open window. There's it's it, it's now it's 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 boom 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 boom. It, it's just I mean it's perfectly it's perfectly suited for movies movie right you know writing. I think you're absolutely correct, but but it's also it's also the opposite of what you need for the movie. So the reason the reason why I think that that my camera didn't take off like James Bond took off, even though. Those books were way bigger than the than, than the Fleming books were. Uh, Mickey's books were, were. I mean, we're talking about a guy who sold 600 million copies in his lifetime. That's. I mean, that makes somebody like James Patterson look like he's a, a piker. And and so you, you you have with. I lost my thread. I lost my thread. He was different from Bond. Well. You were talking about first person. First, first person. I'm sorry about that. Um, Bond was in third person. Right? Yeah, it, Bond is a, definitely in third person. And what happens? What happens with with my camera? And we talked about this earlier. People could I the reader could identify with my camera, and the, to what degree the reader had it, a mental image. It was created not by Mickey but by the reader, so that. You had every, so writing, reading fiction is collaborative. Obviously, it's the it's the reader plus the writer. So everybody went into those movies as 
poor Biff Elliott, everybody would have those movies with their conception of what my camera should look like and should be like, and, including Mickey. And But if you look at the Bond novels, you get a real picture of who this guy is, inside and out. So when someone says, well, that's not, that's not how I imagined my camera. Well, how many ways was my camera imagined by however many readers read about my camera? What movie is going to satisfy that? Well, it's also, it, too, also too, the, the, the book's bond, the, the novel bond, is quite different from the original Sean Connery portrayal. I mean, Sean Connery was this big, husk, at, at, for the time, big, strong guy, whereas I, I, I believe the original Bond in, in the Fleming books, I've only read two or three of them, was more of a, not middle-aged accountant, but he wasn't, he wasn't a buff stud like Connery. Well, I read those books at the time, and I, I can't speak, because I haven't read them since, to be quite frank, but I, 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 I was there the, the first time that Dr. No opened, and when he said Bond, James Bond, I was on board. Yeah. That was him. And when, when he, sh th there's a moment in there that's a Pierce Blaine moment, which is that shows you just how much Bond depends on Hammer. When the, when, when Sean Connery, I think he's seated and this guy's on the floor and, and takes a shot at him and, and he's out of bullets. And, and he has that line saying the, the whatever Smith and Wesson holds this many slugs, you've had your six yeah. and shoots him, executes him. That's Spillane. Yeah. And that's what Spillane did. And we haven't talked about this, but one of the things that Spillane did that set him apart was he often had Hammer execute the bad guy. It wasn't just self-defense. Yeah. He'd say, I, I'll, I'll get a self-defense plea. Yeah. And there's a through line through Bond right to Dirty Harry, you know, with the how many bullets you got left, punk. Yeah, well, it's it's really hard to think of too many of these. I mean, Shaft is my camera. Yeah, uh, you know, Shaft. and uh, the guy in Twenty Four was basically my camera. Uh, I mean, you can you have the Men's Adventure series in the seventies and eighties. The girl with the dragon tattoo was my camera in drag. I first thought about that one. No, I mean that kind of hero. Here, though, than Mike. <laughs> yeah, that that kind of the, the hero who who's outside the law. Yeah, and it's really a vigilante, but the vigilante, I think they call him a vigilante, but to me, a vigilante is someone who says, well, the law enforcement's not doing anything, I'm going to step up and do it. Doesn't have that personal thing. He's an Avenger. He's not a, yeah. he's not, he's not, and not a superhero Avenger. He's a oh. real Avenger. And vigilantes generally have a political axe to grind. It's not personal. Right. Yeah, yeah they go out and take take out whoever's bothering them. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I think Spillane is fairly apolitical, oddly, uh, at least in the, in the early books. I want to continue uh, a, a little bit about the writing, because uh, we can talk about the mythos and this and that. But um, obviously, and I, one of the, the comparisons that some of the critics who have appreciated Spillane have made is obviously to Hemingway. That same sort of rat-a-tat-tat, you know, just you know, short sentences, uh, uh, you know, thing. Um, let me ask you to start with you, Kevin, first, and then I'll go to Max. Um, uh, do you see a through line uh, from uh, from Hemingway, and how easily does that style transfer over into Spillane, into that genre, from, you know, quote-unquote, literary writing to genre writing? Um. Hemingway, to me, was more a contemporary of Hammett than uh, Spillane. So, you know, there's actually people way smarter than me that sort of argue about whether Hemingway or Hammett first came up with that sort of taught hard-boiled style. Uh, Spillane came along much later, and by then he was influenced by everyone they had influenced. So... It's sort of hard to say that Spillane was directly influenced by Hemingway, but certainly that sort of taught terse, the sky was green, she was dead, whatever, that chop, chop, chop thing. Um, by, by the time Spillane came along uh, in the 40s, that had been become something of, uh, that was the style of tough, uh, crime fiction for, you know, 
couple of decades by then. So if it if he was influenced by Hemingway, I could be wrong. Maybe he he was a devout fan. But I would say it was more a second-hand influence. He was influenced by those who had been directly influenced by Hemingway and Hammett. Um, I think the macho. I think the macho element of, of Hemingway generally influenced Mickey, the man's man thing. But you know, Mickey was really. Uh, I mean, first of all, initially, I I think he was kind of just a. Uh, I used to call him the Grandma Moses of uh, mystery writers because he was so primal and just what he did. And then he got to be a better stylist and craftsman as he went on in, in his later books. But it's the first books that are magical and because he's, un, you know, he's unbridled. He's, he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing. So he does whatever he, he wants to do. But he always was the, the chop, chop, chop. You're only going to see that when it's appropriate. Like when the, when the woman dr jumps in front of his car, you know, and about, you know, but yeah, there's the tons of stuff in Spain where he, yeah. sure. but there's tons of stuff in Spain that w w where they go on and on and on and on a fight scene where it's, it's a long sentence because he's holding you down in the scene and he's not letting you up for air. And so, so there's, there's a lot. And then the poetry does the, the noir poetry, which is the kind of thing that, it was kind of in the air. I mean, certainly that was Chandler. I'd say Chandler was a big influence because of the the noir poetry of Chandler. Sad like, yeah, and things like Naked City, you know, that whole and, and even even Dragnet. This is the city uh, that he would say at the beginning of the Dragnet show. And these these portraits of Manhattan, particularly Manhattan in the rain, weather is incredibly important in 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 Spain particularly rain. I mean, if it's raining in a, in a, in a Mickey Spillane book, put on your seatbelt. It's going to get, it's going to get nasty. And there's going to be a corpse somewhere. It's, he's going to make, uh, yeah, what Race Williams said when there, when there are better corpses, I'll make them. That's a yeah. Race Williams line. Well, it's sort of the anti-Hitchcock. Uh, anti Hitchcock always said, if you have a scene, the scene is one thing. But if you know that there's a corpse underneath the floorboards, it changes the whole scene. Spillane was, wasn't Spillane yeah. wasn't that subtle though. Yeah, but he was in the, he, he wasn't he wasn't showing you the, the the corpse under the table. It's making you feel like maybe there's a corpse under the table because yeah. of the mood. And and again, rain is rain is tears. Yeah. Rain is 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 godly sorrow. And he's he used that. And he probably overused it, but I loved it. I loved it. So let me ask you, Max, you had mentioned uh, Agatha Christie, and famously, uh, a lot of her stuff now would probably even be considered uh, non-PC. And I want to ask about how today's generation and how it's, his, the view of him has changed, because Christie herself, a, pro, a prim lady, uh, she wrote a book called Ten Little Niggers, which became Ten Little Indians, which now is known as, and then there were none. To what degree does sexism homophobia, racism, uh, what, was he talking about the, the these and those, you know, using all those N-words and, and those kinds of things, or, or what? Well, he, he really was, um, Mike Hammer was, was really a friend of the underdog, and he really did hang around with, uh, you know, the the flotsam and jetsam of, uh, of, of society. And so you don't really see a lot of, I mean, I'd say there's some homophobia in there. I'd say there's, there's obvious sex, what would be called sexism today. Uh, but as I said, not, I don't see misogyny and I, I don't see, I don't see prejudice because I, I see him treating people equally and, and sticking up for them. A lot of these, a lot of these books. I mean, farewell, my lovely starts as, which is maybe one of the two or three great private eye novels ever written. Ha has some very, you know, by by our standards, racist uh, terminology in it in the first chapter or two. Um, I fight this when I'm writing historical stuff. I fight this all the time because what am I? How am I supposed? How am I supposed to write about a guy? in the 1940s and have him not have certain homophobic attitudes or not have him have certain prejudices. And, you know, 
Do I have him say African American before that term was popularized, or do I have him say colored? He would say colored. And so, you know, so I tend to use colored, and then I get in trouble. Yeah. Well, and so, well, misanthropy is egalitarian, I guess, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's no doubt uh, a lot of, if he were submitting manuscripts now, They'd be like, oh, you can't say that. Oh, you can't do that. Well, couldn't you make them something other than thugs, you know? Like, uh, I, the jury, probably has the most racist depictions of a couple of black guys. And, but but it's, it's also in a bar you that... Divorce, you can't divorce a book from the time it was written in. No. Uh, you could. I've heard the same thing about like Chandler and and yet there, most uh, Spillane, Chandler, Hammett. There's a there's a matter of factness about differences. I mean, my my dad was prop what would be considered racist, but he was a cheerful racist. Mm -hmm. You know, he he used the language of the times, but you know, it, the theory was. Oh, this group of people is this. But then in his personal life, it's like, hey, it's your turn to buy the beer. Yeah. Use the N word or something. And he was cheerful racist. You know, it was it only went as deep as theoretical, not practical, because it was someone else's round, you know. Um, I, I think a lot of these writers from an earlier era, the, 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 a lot of them weren't racist. It was just the language of the times and the expectations of the time. They were far more tolerant than some of the movies made during the same era, which reduced whole groups of people to jabbering morons because they didn't fit this or that. Well, you know? it, it depends active or, or malignant racism. Like people, all, some PC people say, well, Abraham Lincoln was a racist. Well, it's like, no shit, he was born in 1819. But the fact that he overcame that and, saw, and emancipated the slaves, that's the thing that's important. Yeah, well, yeah, of course it is. The, the scene you're talking about, if I'm remembering that scene, uh, and I, I, I have, don't have the world's greatest memory, but I did reread I, the Jury a year or two ago. And yeah, he has a fight with a couple of black guys. And there's some, what we'd call racist references to them as he fights them. But as I recall, he was going into a bar that he frequented that was a black bar with a, where he knew the bartender who was a black guy, and they were friends. So, you know, I, I look at it like if... Yeah, they try to stick him up or something, and then he inflicts way more punishment than they intended for him. He is, yeah. He, uh, Mickey always said that Mike Hammer was a, was a good guy, but he wore the black hat. He, it was all about, I will fight evil with their methods yeah and show them what you know that's the way you teach them a lesson yeah there was a unrelenting quality to him like i said when i was comparing him to race williams you know uh race williams may quibble a bit about his methods and try and justify them or that mike hammer has no time for that he is someone to kick in the stomach you know it's just straight through I, I would I would argue with you only a little bit, and that is that what I consider his best novel is One Lonely Night. And One Lonely Night is full of soul searching from my camera. In fact, it's almost entirely about soul searching because it starts where he's on this lonely bridge in the snow, in the rain that turns to snow, and he's just had a a judge uh, let him go, but but condemn him as, as the worst thing society could possibly breed. And he's wondering. And then the, the, the damsel in distress he goes to save looks at him and is so frightened by the way he looks, she, she commits suicide. And, and this, through this whole book, he's, he's thinking about this judge who Spillane characterizes having eyes like berries on a bush. And I mean, that's a, that's, that's a guy you can write. His yeah. eyes are like two berries on a bush. And, you you know, like the guy in the pork pie hat, he knows how to, to do words that will stick with you and you 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 take you right through it. And so uh, he, he ultimately now he ultimately concludes. 
that he's been put on earth to kill the bad people for God. Now, one might say that's a bit of a stretch. I, I mean, that's that's not Race Williams. That's certainly not like uh, Philip Marlowe. It's certainly not Sam Smith. That's still on the internet too. I mean, he's uh, uh, he he is at his best. Uh, you know, he's psychotic. I mean, there's no question. My camera is psychotic, and uh, you know, as I've as I've written about my camera, because what I did was I I was blessed with this task, and I don't consider it a task. When before Mickey's passing, he 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 gave me his last novel to finish, which was almost finished. But then he told his wife, take everything you find around here, and he had a lot of manuscripts going in different offices, and give to Max. You'll know what to do. And so I, the first six, I think, had substantial manuscripts that I finished. And then by the end, they were more like synopses and, as you said, fragmentary things. And I would always try to do the book, try to figure out when he wrote it. Sometimes there would be evidence. And place it in his in his chronology, my cameras and Mickey's. Where, how old was Mickey when he wrote this? Where was Mickey's head? And I, I kind of knew. And only about three times that I get to write about the psychotic my camera. Mostly it was the better adjusted my camera who matured and mellowed and still killed bad guys, but was maybe a little bit more like the Stacy Keach my camera that people know from TV. So let me ask you. It's a pleasure to write about the psychotic my camera. Yeah, I love writing about the crazy and Mike Cameron. You wonder what would have happened if the the slightly calmed down Mike Hammer had been in the first few books. Would he have had the impact? Probably not. It's those I the jury and um, my gun is quick and vengeance is mine. That's like bang, bang, bang. You know that it's Jaws with a fedora you know he's well, just there, um, there, right. there's an, another interesting thing that turned up in research uh for, for the for the book which i will again mention is going to be called spillane uh king of pulp fiction mickey wrote a second mike hammer book in 1948 and he um submitted it to his editor and the book had the first book i the jury had not done that well in hardcover and the paperback wasn't out yet. The paperback is what exploded. Yeah. Just exploded. And so basically the publisher, you know, just kind of, you know, then he said, then when he brought the manuscript back after I the jury hit, they looked at the manuscript and they didn't like it. This is the twisted thing. Right? The twisted thing. And the twisted thing is a book. It's a very good My Camera book. It's a Mike Hammer book that doesn't doesn't take place in Manhattan. And it is about, I mentioned a child. I'm going to do a spoiler alert here. But the bad guy turns out to be a child. And they did not like that. They thought that was, the, the, the editors did not, and they, they sent it back to him. And in that book, it did not have it was very much a typical my camera book, but there was no revenge aspect in it at all. Didn't have that. He actually had a client. So, so you see there that I, the jury, was meant to be a one-off in terms of that vengeance theme. So I, the jury, hits in paperback and explodes, and what people are responding to is my camera, the Avenger. So either Mickey, and we don't know, Mickey or his editor, Victor Waybright, who was a very brilliant editor, somebody said, keep that vengeance theme going because that's what the public is relating to. So in My Gun is Quick, we have vengeance again. And, you know, in Vengeance is Mine, guess what? Vengeance is Mine is about vengeance. I mean, so, so you wonder if the second book published had not been something that, seemed so much an extension of I, the jury, would, would the Spillane uh, boom have happened? Because he's while he's tough and there's sex, he, it's sexy, it's not that I'm going to get the guy that killed my friend. You know, that was gone. And I wonder, I wonder if they didn't do him a favor 
rejecting that, even though it's a very good book. And then after that, he held, he, he just basically held that book ransom. He <laughs> didn't give it to him until he had a new contract many years later. Um, so let me just talk uh, one final thing. Uh, I want to move on to sort of Spillane as he became known in popular culture. Um, yeah. Uh, it seems to me a lot of people who have ripped on Spillane's writing style will say, well, it's just the same old cliches and whatnot. But as you talked about the, the berries, his eyes, he has these little moments of poesy, but he also uses very idiomatic language of the time. Um, if, uh, if either one of you want to talk about the difference between cliches of, of genre, the detective or fiction, however you want to call it, noir fiction, uh, versus the idiomatic uh, stylist. Uh, Kevin, you want to jump on that one? Uh, I'm not even sure I understand the question. I do wonder, though, what taking off like a flock of turtles means. That was an eye of the jury, and I still don't understand it. A flock of turtles. Uh, come on, Kevin, if you don't understand that, I mean, come on. Know, I'm a foreigner, you know? I don't understand this American language, man. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was uh, well, I, you know, I mean, trying I to work in a Chandler simile or what. Well, I think there's a difference between cliches and tropes. You know, the uh, it's on how the writer uses them. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and uh, but I think Spillane is a special case because when he came along in '47. There, we had had, what, since 1931, the private eye had been established. There's yeah. the secretary who was in love with her boss. There's the, you know, there's the two cops. There's usually one who's friendly and one who's not friendly. And we've got femme fatales and we've got, you know, we've got Casper Gutman, bad guy. I mean, you can see this stuff recycled. It was on the radio a lot. Yeah. A lot on the radio. It was in the movies quite a bit. So, so it was not very fresh in 1947 as a... Elaine uh, definitely shook the genre up. He shook it up. There's a new book out. It's called The Truman Gumshoes. I have that. And, and it's fascinating because he chooses um, Mike Hammer, Ross McDonald's Lou Archer, Bart Spicer's Carney Wild, and Wade Miller's... Um, Max Thursday, how they all changed the genre, and they were all writing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the biggest impact of all their careers was while well, Truman was president. You know, it's you could argue about whether Truman himself had anything to do with it, but they were all of this post-war era. Yeah. And it's fascinating how they had taken what Max was talking about, where the private eye had become sort of a formula, and they all kicked it into different directions. Uh, McDonald went into a more psychological way. Uh, Mike Hammer was bringing back sort of the pulp violence and sex that had been there. And he had um, a, a secretary who was far more than a secretary. You had, you know, the, the, the genre was changing even, well, they weren't changing it dramatically the way it did in the late 70s and 80s, but they were tinkering with the formula, allowing them to have relationships allowing them to dig deeper more than just the standard uh, private eye secretary, go out, solve the case, go home. You know, the lone wolf suddenly became something else. Well, and, Mike, Ham Mike Hammer was, and Mickey Spillane, they weren't trying to do realism. When you, when you see people say that it's realism, I'm like, well, what life are you living? Because that doesn't look anything like any life I've ever led. And... What you have is him looking at all these cliches and tropes and using them in kind of a fever dream landscape. It's not real at all. And he, the very fact that they're, they're old and we know what they are and that they're, they're inherently larger than life, he uses that. He uses that as he takes advantage of it. And one of the things he does is he, you know, the, the beautiful girl comes in, flirts with the private eye. And Mickey Spillane, he then sleeps with her. Okay, that's new. Yeah. That happened like once in Hammett, you know, but that's new. The two bad guys come in, grab the private eye, start roughing them up. Then he kicks their teeth in. 
Yeah. And they, they bleed on the floor and then he stomps on their neck and then he does the so so he takes these things that are admittedly cliches and familiar and says, All right, let's, these servicemen, they know this is BS. Let's let's now let's show them what happens. And and so there's there's a lot of going another step. And then, then there's also these, you know, he, he loves he loves like the beginning of Kiss Me Deadly. That is as good a first chapter as I've ever read in any book in my life. And it is it is so dreamlike and unreal. Um, I don't know. I think he's, but again, I think he was kind of a primitive. I don't think I think he was just like, wow, this is working. Because if you read out of the jury, it's not as much of a fever dream as the other books. It's he's got this thing about the the the, the friend, and he's got this thing about well, I'm going to show that a that a GI would choose his friend over some beautiful woman because they've been in the trenches together. But the middle of it, yeah, there's some tough stuff and some sex, but it's not that different from what you'd see in any private eye novel. Yeah, but the other books are crazy. They have crazy sh shit going on in them. Like the 24-hour rain. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, a fever dream is exactly what they... When, when he hits full steam, that's what it is. It's a fever dream. It's and like, when he gets older as a writer uh, and he comes back, um, he's writing better, technically. But some of the fire is out of the belly. And he's, he's, he's thinking like a craftsman, not like an artist who's been just let loose out of his cage briefly. So uh, I want to bring up, uh, I, when I had done an essay some years back, 20 years ago now, um, I brought up four points that, uh, about the writing style that I just want to get your comments on, and then we'll talk about his persona. One is that he obviously started out as a minimalist writer. He was also someone big into archetypes, uh, archetypal uh, characters, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, his breathy style, especially at moments of action, were an example of, of uh, the form that he was writing and following the function of the action. And the fourth one was that it was more important in his, especially the early stuff that I'm more familiar with, that uh, it wasn't as important about what or why something occurred, but how it occurred. And that this allows the reader to be able to piece together things that are a subtle form of foreshadowing that allows the reader to start rooting for Mike Hammett to figure out what they may have already suspect. So what is your take on uh, those four comments I made, either one of you? Those are all good observations, yeah. extremely good observations. And, and we were talking just a, a moment ago about these archetypes, but that what he did was he took the archetypes and then he'd do something new with them. Hmm. And that he, he'd take them another step. Yeah. It's like scary bad guy comes in, and now we see what really happens. If the bedroom door closes, now now we leave the door open, and we see what happens. And you know the the and the, the one of the things about him is I love his use of italics. He and and whenever I'm doing a Spillane, you know, finishing a Spillane book that I'm writing, I always have to deal with copy editors who say, "Well, this can't. Why is this in italics?" And I was like, "Because it's in italics." Because it's this is emphasis. This is not. I'm not trying to do thoughts. I'm not. Well, all the things that you think I'm supposed to do with this is like this is an important paragraph where you know the girl opens up her robe and her body is twisted with you know the it twisted flesh from flames and 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 he does that italics. It makes you just go whoa. You know, it's it's like he's a filmmaker. Using using punctuation, yeah. using you know he's 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 using punctuation. He's using italics. He's he's you know he's doing things for how they look on the page. Yeah, he, and he I mean I, I I you know and there's a lot of dialogue, and and that's the thing that James M. Cain said. the The reader's eye loves a ragged right margin. <laughs> You don't want to see a whole bunch of copy. You want to see that ragged right margin, which is a, a poetry thing if you get right down to it. It's sort of like a skyline sideways. 
Exactly. Yeah. You no, those are all great observations, in my opinion. Someone who studied a lot of typography, uh, it's like, yes, his stuff is like, you know, this big dump, and then suddenly a couple of short sentences that are just hanging there, it's like, bang, bang, see? And then he puts italics or something. It's like he's get criticized a for that. bag or something. I used to get criticized for that early in my career when I was trying to move from paperbacks into hardcovers. And when I do those short sentences, they'd say, you're writing like a paperback writer. And I go like, thank you. You know, <laughs> that was the point, you know, mixing it up, mixing it up. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Spillane, the mythos, and then his lady is in sure. death. Um, uh, growing up, uh, I was born in 65, growing up in the 70s, um, I first encountered Spillane through the Miller Lite commercials. And then the other thing he was sort of known, I don't know how well he liked it, was the connection with Ayn Rand, who was seemingly was obsessed with him. So uh, can we address uh, either uh, or both of those, the, the fame in the Miller Lite commercials and Iran's unhealthy Randian obsession with him? Uh, Kevin, if you want to take that first. Uh, God, I'm Canadian. I never saw any of the beer commercials. Okay. Except clips on YouTube. So by the time I discovered them, they were long in the past. And okay. Ayn Rand, uh, once again, I'm Canadian. She wasn't a big thing anywhere except in the U.S., really, despite her fans. Hmm. But she made a big impact in the U.S. for sure. Well, she wrote about him and, and said that, like, I think there's a famous quote about where she says, reading him is like listening to a military band, you know. <laughs> oh, but she he said talked about the things. But he did. He did know her, and he didn't like her. And I think that she had kind of a crush on him. He didn't uh, like her. Pardon me. Did you say he didn't like her? Or he, he did like her. He. I mean, they were friends. They. They. They were friends. They. They made some talk show appearances together. Uh, and you know, I. I wish I. I don't know if those even still exist, but. Well, that'd oh. be interesting, like on an objectivist and a JW. <laughs> well, I, I, I think what she liked about him in his fiction was the strength of the protagonists, because she did that same kind of protagonist yeah. in the Fountainhead. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the architect of the Fountainhead, yeah, right. yeah, he's not much different than my camera, if you get right down to it. Well, I, I think... I think I think Spillane was a far better writer than Ayn Rand. I mean, don't get me started on Ayn Rand and her lead and prose. But yeah, uh, well, but they both are writing. I, I would say this, and we, we we talked about this a little bit. It's he's not writing realism. He's not trying to write real realism. This is melodrama, and she was a melodrama person, and so she saw she probably recognized in him somebody who knew how to write melodrama well. So, before we talk about his death, um, is, are there any other the non Mike Hammer uh, works that uh, uh, someone coming to Spillane out of the blue uh, should check out? I see, you know, uh, some other characters and then other novels. Uh, what what non Mike Hammer stuff would you say is essential, if anything, uh, either of you? I think I think you start with Mike Hammer and and then uh, then you say, well, gee, I've run out of my camera, so now I'll look at some of the other stuff. There are those that are big exponents of his book, The Erection Set, which is a typical shocking title for, from him, which is really kind of a, a bestseller style, you know, Jacqueline Suzanne style book that kind of combines the Count of Monte Cristo with the hard boiled novel. It's just pretty outrageous. Uh, the Last Cop Out is a pretty good crime novel. Some of his novellas are very readable and they were collected. There's a collection out right now called Stand Up and Die that, that I edited. That's, those are all very, very fun to read. Um, I'm not a fan of the Tiger Man books in general. That was his response. Tiger Man was his James Bond. I mean, he... he it, he, he has this comeback with my camera, then Bond happens, and he feels like he has to write the spy espionage thing to was, compete. Was Tiger Man more like that? Didn't Dean Martin have a series of spy movies? Wasn't that more spoofy at all? No, well, the Matt Helm books were really ser quite serious and are quite, quite well done. 
and those movies are just basically parodies of their source. Tiger Man was basically my camera under another name. I mean, he's he's an international secret agent who pretty much never leaves New York. Uh, so it's uh, they're not him at his best. The very first one is kind of good, Day of the Guns, but basically that that's not should not in my opinion should not be on the top of your spoiling reading list. Uh, he's, he did these books for kids that are yeah. very interesting. Um, and and I just edited a collection of his three novellas that he did for as kids' books. One has never even been printed before. It's called The Shrinking Island. Uh, so I don't know. Kevin, is there something else on his reading list that you would recommend beyond my camera? In the um, two kids' books, I seem to remember. I might have read one when I was a kid. and Yeah. But that was so long ago. Uh, no, I, really, if you're going to read Spillane, Spillane read the Mike Hammers, because that was him at his very, very best. Um, those first, those early books in particular, they're like, that's America getting punched in the stomach. It's a whole <laughs> generation just, there, there was this sense of, uh, hey, this guy gets us. And um, there's, you know, and, you know, it's it's just read the Mike Hammer books, you know. If you're at all interested in detective fiction, you have to read them to see what the fuss is about, you know. Even now, you can get people arguing in bars at any voucher con or anything about how good or not good Mike Hammer was or Nicky Spillane. I mean, the was it the private eye writers gave them their life achievement award in the early eighties, I think. Yeah. It, the Ed, uh, the <laughs> mystery writers of America, another decade or so to get around to it. I mean, the people that understand Mike Hammer got them. The people that didn't like him, a lot of them just didn't get it. You know, what I'm amazed at in my, deep dive into Spillania in the last week or so was how many people have opinions and you wonder if any of them have ever read them or if they've just read the opinions because mm. um, you see the same like as Mike uh, Max said you see the same quotes from the same books over and over and over. This is one of my big gripes with criticism in general, and I, especially in movies. For example, there's a famous movie by Michelangelo Antonioni called Blow Up, where they use the names of the characters from the screenplay, but on screen, the names don't appear. So that tells me that the person uh, writing the review was paying more attention to the PR than the actual film. And I think that's a lot of uh, with Spillane, too, is they say, oh, uh, you know, she was there. She had big bosom, you know, sex, blah. And they gloss, they, they gloss through him and they miss the, the good stuff. Re read the Amazon reviews for any self-published book and see how often the reviews are basically the same paragraph paraphrased over and over, mm -hmm. which often comes from the back cover of the book or the yeah. synopsis anyway. It's like, okay, 200 people gave this five star reviews. Mm -hmm. All of them misspelled the same word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, it's catching. He, yeah, uh, it's, so it's contagious. So Spillane died in uh, 06. He was what, 87 or 88? 88. Um, was he at at peace with his uh, his personal life and his writing life, his reputation? What what was that like the last year or two? Very much, uh, he was at peace with himself and his his life there in in uh, Mer Mer Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. His wife Jane and he were very very happy, very close. Uh, he was writing a lot. He had three offices, and that's some of why I, I've had things to do is because he had a bunch of books going and he, 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 he'd get bored with one and go, back, go work on the other one. And so, I mean, I, I brought home two, two file cabinet drawers worth of unpublished material by him. So I've been doing that since 2007 books have been at least one book a year has been, been published. And, um, he, he was a very, you know, I, I always say he was a, a 
a simple a simple soul and a complex man. Uh, he just uh, he he couldn't have been just very very much a guy who, who everybody knew around where he lived. They they loved him. They were not super impressed with him. He was uh, just this guy they knew, and um, I think he he didn't seem to feel guilty about anything he had done as a writer, even though he was very much with the Jehovah's Witnesses again. But he wrote a Mike Hammer late in his life and was working on uh, Mike Hammer at, at the time of his death. So, I, I mean, one of the funny things about, like, the Goliath Bone, where, which he had, a, he had a draft that was, that's the last book that he wrote about Mike Hammer. And I, I had a draft with everything but the last two chapters. But it was very, it was very short for him. And I always thought that was because he was writing against the clock. He was trying to get to get something done. So, so the book really only when I when I had it typed up, it was only 130, 150 pages that I had to work with. So I, people would ask me, and then I read it and I loved it. And then people would ask me, "Well, what did you, what did you what did you do in here? What what what's your your contribution to this book?" And I would say, "Well, I wrote this plain stuff." <laughs> I put in the sex and the violence because he 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 started with a with a rocking first chapter and then the rest of it and he hadn't put in a murder mystery, so I said I put in a murder mystery I put in the sex and I put in the violence I did the spelling stuff and he carried the rest of it, so he 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 was very mellowed at that point there was a there's a time where I was talking to him. It's he had a bar outside his house that was kind of built around a tree. And I was down there actually to, to testify in a case that had to do with some looting that had been done to his house when Hurricane Hugo hit. And some of the original painting of One Lonely Night was gone, the cover. And I was there to, to say how much that would have been worth because I collect art. I collect pop culture type art. And so we're sitting talking and he, he, he started talking about what he'd like to do to those guys that looted his house and he, you know, his hands and he was just, man, and then, then, he, then he backed off and he just, he said, but I don't do that anymore. And he was just like, I just, for a moment I saw that, I saw him. You saw, saw my camera emerge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he was still in there, but basically he, he, he'd calmed down. And, and that's why it was hard for him to write my camera toward the end. And the way he really, I think, rec dealt with it was he, he allowed Hammer to be him. What so, you see is what you get. So yeah. let me just ask a final question of you, Max, and then I'll uh, end the show with uh, asking Kevin a question. Um, uh, when you said that he, he was working on a, a final Mike Hammer, uh, since he had roots in this sort of comic book past, was Mike Hammer in the 21st century or was he still back in the mid 20th century, you know, like the Superman is eternally young. Uh, did, did he did he age Mike Hammer? Was this an old Hammer, or was Hammer young in the 21st century? Well, he he kind of fudged it. He he liked to say Mike Hammer was always never got older than 35 or 40, but he did he did place him in the in the times. Okay. And one of the things I've done in 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 writing these books is is age age him. Maybe not as old as he would be. Because he's a World War II veteran, but he's probably he's he's probably approaching seventy in the last book, and uh, he definitely he he had a cell phone because Mickey used a cell phone, so my camera used a cell phone, and you know, that kind of and computers. Velda had a computer in the in the last book. I actually had some people complain to me about why did I do that? Well, I didn't. Mickey, Mickey did it, and. He, he he just saw him as an up-to-date character. But also remember, the Goliath Bone was a post-9-11 book. It was a book about terrorism. It was a response to what happened to the World Trade Center. And so for that reason, he couldn't pretend he was doing a 1950s book or a 1960s book. It, had, it was contemporary. And he thought of himself as a contemporary author. 
Well, uh, just so people know, I will link to both of your websites, your nominal websites, maxallencollins.com and kevinburtonsmith.com. Kevin, let me just give you then the final word. Anything else that you'd like to say about uh, Mickey Spillane, for especially uh, newbies? Um, he wrote some of the greatest private eye novels of the, mid the middle of the last century. Uh, he picked up the uh, genre and patted it on the backside and sent it in some directions. It probably might not have gone into if he hadn't come along. And one of the absolute highlights of my life was a few years before Mickey Spillane died, Max somehow dragged him out to California for the Los Angeles pulp and paperback show. And I got to meet Mickey Spillane. And Max had to explain to him who he was. And he looks at me and he goes, how are you doing, kid? And I thought, that's just one of my favorite things ever. So thank you for that, Max. And uh, thank you for not making me look like too much of a doofus here. Uh, thank you, too, Dan. <laughs> my apologies for talking so much, but... Uh, oh, no, because... Mickey was talking to too. It must have seen me. Oh, well, oh, I have to write that one down. <laughs> well, thanks to both of you. It was a great show. It's thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Dan, thank you very, very much for inviting me.